Okay, so um, this work also had a lot of help from a lot of interested parties and some or hopefully most or all of them are listed here on the slide. So um, why are we here today and what is this MOOC thing? Um, has anybody, raise your hand in this room if you have taken a MOOC. Ooh, very impressive. All right, good for you. Uh, raise your hand if you've taken a Michigan MOOC. Some, some, not all of you. Some of you have been taking them elsewhere. That's okay. There's a lot of MOOCs out there. So um, we're going to talk about what we've been doing here at Michigan with MOOCs. And the first thing I wanted to start with is this is the hype cycle. I think many of you are familiar with this. Whenever there is a sort of new technology on the market, this is typically what happens. And so you could ask yourself, where are we in the MOOC hype cycle? Or do you, you can see some of the terms there. What do you think? Anyone? Shout them out. I think we're headed for the trough. I think we're headed for the trough. I think you're right. Um, right now, it, there are subcategories on that line. Here they are. I know you can't read them all, but um, activity beyond early adopters, we definitely hit that. Um, we're starting right, get negative press starts, right? Are you starting to see more of those kind of articles now? Um, supplier consolidation and failure, that's definitely happening. We know last week uh, Dan Russell talked about how Google is partnered up with uh, edX. And uh, so that on the way down here, there's where the venture capital, additional venture capital comes in. Um, less than 5% of the potential audience is fully adopted. But what I want to say about this is um, I think we're already here at Michigan in this label. Not necessarily this place on the curve, but what I think is great about Michigan is we are applying this back here and not waiting for that trough of disillusionment to uh, really come full-fledged. So this is methodologies, methodologies and best practices developing. And that's really why we're, why we're looking at this data and where we hope to get to. Um, this, is, this is a little uh, graph showing how the press has been oriented toward MOOCs. And you can see it's going up and up. And I don't, can you open the Chronicle of Higher Ed without at least one mount? article on MOOCs right now? I don't, I don't think so. Um, Michigan announced its partnership with Coursera in April of uh, 2013. So that was over here somewhere? 2013? 20, oh, 20, 2012, right. So right about there. Um, so what we're going to talk about today is um, what we know about MOOCs at Michigan, what we know about the users of them, what we know about um, how those users are becoming engaged with the MOOCs, and then we have some information from a survey that we have more recently been able to administer to the people who took the Michigan MOOCs. So let's back up a minute with history. So here it was. We were one of the first four institutions to join Coursera. We did this in April 2012. And the first course was offered uh, was Scott Page's model thinking course, which was launched then in the spring of 2012. Princeton, Stanford, uh, University of Pennsylvania, now Coursera, were early joiners too, and now Coursera has, I think, 81 institutional partners. Um, and the important thing to know about the way Coursera courses are offered is they're offered in sessions, which are kind of like a semester, right? A start to finish. And we here at Michigan have about three sessions that we run. Um, in October, there's some courses that start. Roughly in February, there's some courses that start. And then in May, some courses that start. So we kind of have a fall, winter, and spring term. I'm talking mostly about uh, our campus. The medical campus is getting more into this. And they're doing some of their own things with regard to that. Here's a list of the courses in the first um, first iterations of the Michigan MOOCs and you can look them up on the Coursera website and for those few a very few of you who have not taken a MOOC I wanted to just quickly show you what the interface looks like so here's Gautam Calls uh, the home page of his finance course which has been offered I think three times now and you can uh, see here that one thing to notice is this button here enroll for free this is what you hear all the hype about. But you can also enroll for a signature track. 
that's going to now cost you a little money and gives you a different kind of certificate of achievement. And I can show you what one of those looks like. And uh, you can add it to a watch list if you want to know when Scottam's next class is going to start up. It, it will ping you and let you know. You also see we've got a little social media action going on over here, um, being liked on Facebook pages and uh, the usual social media stuff. The thing to note about the, um, when you're in Coursera is you've got a list of tools over here. Anyone who's been on C tools, this is very familiar. Uh, some of these are direct links to the course syllabus or the course schedule. Documents is like our resources. Assignments, of course, are um, obvious. Video lectures, that's the main component, right? This is the thing about what MOOCs are because they look like this. So this is the kind of screen that you get. You get the talking head. Um, you get the PowerPoint slides. And this is the thing that you watch when on a weekly basis or not, which we'll talk about. And you can see here, here's a list of video lectures. And you can click on them to open them. This is uh, a screenshot that we took this morning from a previous class, which is why the list is long. But usually a class releases the videos on the schedule. And so this list. Uh, uh, gets longer as the time goes on, but you can go back and click and re-watch re a video. Um, the assignment is the other important component of the MOOC. So um, they are generally like this. They are multiple choice questions. Uh, but the other thing to note is this in the assignment list and this warning that you get is that if you submit any time after the hard deadline, you will not receive credit. And because we open this assignment after the course had closed, it reminds me of this here too. I can take this exam or this uh, assignment. I can see how I scored, but it's not going to give me credit for having done that, and I can't earn credit from the course after the fact for doing this later. At this point in time, with the structure of this particular course, and when you're done, if you have completed all the assignments and scored above a thir certain threshold, which I think is generally about 70%, um, then you will get a Coursera uh, certificate of accomplishment. Some courses also offer a, um, uh, a distinction, certificate with distinction, kind of like honors, I guess, or something. And then if you use this new thing and pay the extra money, you get a different statement of accomplishment that is in the signature track, which has a mechanism that allegedly verifies your identity when you take those. And they do it with photo recognition and your camera on your thing. So there's some attempt, if you're getting this other kind of certificate, to uh, assure someone who might care that you have the certificate that you actually really took it. So our questions when we got the data um, were these. We wanted to know who's, at, who's taking the Michigan MOOCs. What does their participation look like? And what are the students' um, perceptions about their experience in, the, in these MOOCs? And so um, ultimately then what we want to do with some of the answers to these questions is think about how we can inform best practices for uh, online teaching and learning at this massive scale, but also think about are there lessons to be learned there that we can take back on campus? Is there a way to blend some of the experience of the online with the um, on campus? and uh, see what we can learn from doing so. Before I uh, get into the data with you, I want to be clear about where the data comes from. We have primarily two kinds of data. We have the user log data. That's the click data that Coursera captures for us, everything the student does in there. And that data they send to us, um, and we uh, deliver it to ITS. Um, they put it in our warehouse. And then uh, we do what we need to do with the data. Eric has written some scripts that help make that data um, easier to analyze, which we've made available to the larger community. We put them up on GitHub so other people downloading their Coursera data can have a little easier time taking the raw data and turning it into something you can analyze. Um, and so we can know what they did. We can know their class performance, although remember, don't be mistaken, we don't have grades, right? Remember, this is relatively binary outcome. They either get a certificate or they don't. And then for some courses, a certificate with distinction. So unlike some of the analytics we do where we correlate activities with GPA, that's off the table here. We can't do that. 
Um, we also can, in most cases, know their IP address, so we might know where these uh, users are located. And they also have an email address, um, so we can look at that as well. Now, we also um, have survey data. Oh, yes, go ahead. Stephanie, do the course performance data include um, percentage correct or how many times they attempted? The yes, answer? we can do that. So uh, we can do a more fine-grained analysis of performance in that way, which would be very interesting to do, but we haven't yet drilled down in the data at that level. And then we would have to norm it for that class, of course, too, right? Um, so the survey, we did some surveys at the, um, in the early term. Coursera administers those. Um, there's kind of spotty, people take those if they want or not. We get some demographic inter, uh, information from that. And then we've continued to work on the post-course survey, which we send out to everybody who had registered for the course and uh, get back and encourage them to fill it out even if they hadn't completed the course. And um, so we get uh, responses back from some of those. And we've added uh, a course evaluation component to that, as you'll see I have some data. We've replicated the standard Q1 through Q4 questions on this, and um, you'll see what we get when we've done that. Okay, so who's been taking Michigan MOOC courses? Grand total for the courses that we've analyzed, what goes up to and includes the winter 2013 courses, you've got uh, 666,407 registered users of Michigan MOOCs. Big number, that's that massive number, right? This is the kind of scale that people get all excited about when they talk about MOOCs. And the average number of students registered per course, you can see here is 55, and you can see there's variability in the size of these courses, how many users are Attracted by them, Securing Digital Democracy had uh, almost 20,000, but Gotham's Intro to Finance at its peak had 125,000. So they can vary in size. You can also see that here. So the data that I'm talking about today when I'm talking about log data includes the first course we offered, which was Scott Page's course in the winter of 2012. Then the fall of 2012, we had uh, six courses, and there's um, the digital, uh, the, the model thinking course again, and adding the other courses I showed you on the list. And then the winter 2013, uh, where one of the classes wasn't taught then, but is taught later. And you can see that Gotham's course had a peak here and went down a little bit. You can see model thinking went from this size to this size, but then shrank down a bit. So you get a, a sense of the relative uh, proportion of the number of students who take these courses. Yes, Jim? With the exception of the first offering, every course has lower enrollment the second time it's offered. Is that typical of most of the moves? Who can say what's typical right now, right? So we, we now have a couple of other semesters past this data, but we didn't, for the analysis we're talking about today, we didn't have access to all of that data yet. Some of them, I mean, to get it from Coursera, to get it to ITS, to get it cleaned up and loaded. Um, so we can ask that question about Michigan soon. Um, like this course that it wasn't where we skipped it a block here, it has been offered more recently. So does the number, um, I guess, which one is it? This one? The Securing Digital Democracy. Maybe the li line goes up because people didn't get a chance to take it again soon. So we'll see, but that's a very good question. All right, now when I told you how many, that 677,000, um, that was anybody who registered. If you look and see, did anybody register for more than one class, and we think about them as a user, um, it's, a, it's a somewhat lower number because almost 170,000 people have taken more than one class at Michigan. So they do come back for more. Um, and of the users that we can identify, um, we can tell you about where 70% of them live looking at their IP address. And here's, here's what that looks like. So by and large, it's, as you might expect, most of the users are here in the U.S. Um, when I hear people talk about MOOCs, and Dan Russell did this last week, they talk about the kid in India, or the kid, you know. So yeah, we got 9% of our users are in India, and 5% are in Brazil. I think in the Google data, those were flipped. But you can see these are all relatively small proportions um, against the, the largest <laughs> number, the third, really about a third who are from the US. Question. Yes. Um, 
these classes are all just offered in English. That's right. Okay. Right. So you have to be reasonably competent English, at least your uh, recognition of the language. And if you're going to take the test, you, you, they're multiple choice. You don't have to write anything by and large. So um, I think Melissa was next, and then Connie? Nice question. Why can't you get geolocation on 100% of the IP address? Why can't we get geolocation on 100%, Eric? Um, so the log data it has the last access IP. So the last time the user logged in, if they had an IP, it would go there. But then not some people can register <coughs> over even to the class. So they wouldn't have an IP address associated. So we have the IP address for the people who did more than just simply register. Connie. I know that a bunch of Coursera and other MOOC courses have been translated by people in other countries. Do we know whether that has happened to any of the U of M courses? Tim O'Brien, do we know? Has anybody translated these courses and offered them in another language? So we've, we've got a partnership going on. Is that true just for U of M courses, or is this a Coursera partnership? Well, initially they, they used a, a um, transcription service that was that allowed students to do crowdsourced transcriptions, but it was very hit and miss, and the, the English language delivery from that company was pretty poor, and so Coursera decided to, to stop working with them, and so now they only give us free English language uh, transcription, and all of the other languages are based on this new model where they're trying to get companies to fund. Yes. So um, in the previous slide when you said close to about mm. 700,000 people have registered, mm -hmm. um, and then the next slide we're talking about um, you can only represent maybe about 50% of those. So does that mean that those who registered didn't actually view the courses? Hold on. I want to get to that data. I've got some more, but I just wanted to give you a quick view of where these users are. So they're in the U.S. Um, about 4% of them are in Michigan, 21% are in California. You might ask why is that? We don't know except it is the Coursera home base and Silicon Valley is there. Maybe there's just, they're just more visible there. But um, that's where the largest percentage of the users are coming from and then New York and the East Coast. Um, for University of Michigan users, we found uh, 941 people who had at umich.edu addresses. And you can see the breakdown. We could identify who were current students, who were alums, staff, and faculty. So a uh, bunch of you raised your hand that you had taken Michigan MOOC. So maybe, maybe you're one of these people. <coughs> um, males versus females, this is something that people are interested in. You can see that we've got about 2 thirds male to, to one third female. Um, but we did what Dan Russell did. And we broke it down by course. So you imagine by course content, there might be a different appeal to men versus women. So what Steve did is he went to the course catalog and looked at his best guess for what a comparable U of M course that relates to the content of the MOOC course. So digital democracy, the MOOC attracted more women to this topic um, compared to men. Uh, social network analysis. Oh, I said that wrong, didn't I? There are more women in the MOOC class than in the UN. residential campus. There are more women on campus than in the MOOC for the social network analysis, model thinking, here's intro to finance, and so forth. So you can see that there is a variability in how many women come to the class, and it does have a different appeal. Uh, sometimes the online course is attracting more women than the traditional uh, residence-based classes. Um, in terms of race, here's the demographics for what we can know about race. And these are the Coursera cat uh, categories. This is the survey that they uh, put out. 
So we can't match those up exactly to the University of Michigan uh, campus students, but you'll note that it's predominantly uh, white and I think it's 60% white here on campus. So that part is the same. Um, we have different categories, including international. So that makes it hard to sort of to say, uh, is, are these numbers significantly different? But I think what we do know is that there are more um, there are more who identify, um, let's see, Hispanic in this than there is on campus. Schooling, who comes to these courses? There is, again, I think this common idea about MOOCs that they're reaching people who can't otherwise, who don't otherwise have access to higher education. But in fact, when we look at who's using our MOOCs, they are people who already have um, experience and degrees from more traditional based higher education. So they're not the people, by and large, they're not the people who otherwise couldn't go to college or didn't go to college, at least for the Michigan courses here. Um, and of the people who are taking this course while they're a student, um, not very many of them. Most people do this when they're not currently enrolled in, as being a student in some other way. Um, and similarly, uh, who's taking it? Um, mostly people who are employed full time. So they're doing this in their spare time. And we can think about whether that has implications for the, the um, participation rate. So let's get to that part then. So <coughs> this is where we have to think about how we want to define um, engagement. So. Um, Here's the thing that everybody says about MOOCs. You get this huge, huge drop off. So we had the 667,000 people who registered for a class. 62% of those never show up in the first week of class. They register, they never get there. 38% of students watch or download at least one lecture during the course. So that's the number that we're going to use going forward. We are going to call those people engaged users. And we're going to forget about all those other people who are curious or well-intentioned but never showed up even once. So in the data that I'm going to present to you today, I'm only going to talk about this 38% of students who we're going to call engaged users. Okay, now, of those, yes? Uh, so, in a typical class, how many lectures are there, just to get a sense of Okay, that. that's a very good question, and it is important. Um, some classes, we had one class that was a five-week class. We had an eight-week, and a couple nine-weeks, and, and some ten-week classes. So, um, I, what we're going to do is categorize these users, and I will get back to that um, in a second, because what we did was um, we broke the course length into what we called blocks, which um, are roughly equivalent to a session. And especially because for assessments, most courses, if you didn't take the assessment during the right time, you couldn't get credit for it. So um, we're going to call somebody, a student who got graded, if in that block, they showed up, they watched the video, they took the assessment. We're going to call them auditing concurrent if they showed up and watched the video in that particular week but didn't happen to do the assessment. So auditing, that's like what student who audits your class who shows up all the time but doesn't get graded. We also have this artifact, because this is all digital, that you can go in, you can register for the course, ignore it the whole run of the course, show up before the course c closes, and download all the videos. So we're going to call those auditors delayed. We don't know what they're doing. We don't know if they ever watch them. But at least at some point, they had enough interest to go download all those videos to do whatever with them later. So we're going to keep track of them, too. We're going to call them auditing delayed. And then we have the students who are dropped. So these are students who had showed up for the first session, but some point over time stopped showing up. And that means stopped watching the video and stopped taking the assessments. We have very few people who were a graded who dropped to an audit. If you drop, you tend to drop from the condition that you started in in the first or second block. So let me show you. Um, this answers the question about blocks, about how long the courses are. Here's what you really want to see. So remember, this graph, we are forgetting about all those people who never showed up on the first day. Here's the first day. 
So to get on this chart, you had to do something here. And um, the, the, these are the graded students on the first day who showed up for the class and took the assessment. And then you've got your two forms of auditing. Now it's a little bit tricky. You have to remember this light blue line, this auditing delay, we've graphed it over time. But by and large, they're getting credit for this by doing it somewhere down here before the class closes, right? Because you could go and you could decide only to, to um, grab the first lecture or two, but most people who do this delayed auditing tend to grab all the, all the videos. So their line is here, and the um, auditing concurrent is the blue line. So there's several things that you can notice about this. It basically, whatever you're gonna do by, by about course three, session three, is it pretty much who you are throughout. You get an increase in the people dropping over time, but if you're a graded student, you're pretty much hanging in there if you make it through the first few weeks of the course. And if you're auditing and you are doing it in sync with the course, again, you pretty much stay in there through the length of the course. Now you might ask, for the shorter courses, is the pattern different? And does, does someone's behavior in the last week of a five-week session look like someone's behavior in the last week of a 10-week session? And the answer is no. And Dan uh, Russell mentioned this last week as well. Um, doesn't matter how long the course is, the longer the course, the more eventual dropout you get. The students who are represented in here in that five-week class, that's pretty much where they were. They didn't drop out sooner because it was a five-week class. People drop out of uh, week six or week seven because it's week six or week seven. Overall, so we look at those graded because those are the people who are bucking for a certificate, right? 86% um, of them on average, if you were in that graded line and you were hanging in there, you were pretty probably likely to get a certificate of accomplishment. Now there is some variation from class to class. Um, social network analysis had 68%, so if you hung in there and took them all and took all those quizzes, you, the quarter of people maybe didn't get over the 70% threshold, as opposed to uh, this course where the exams um, were uh, easier, I guess, to achieve the 70%. So you could think about is a MOOC a hard MOOC on two dimensions. The length, because we know the longer it goes, the less likely you're going to be to stick it out. And um, by looking at the proportion of people who do stick it out who get above the 70% threshold. So, okay, so what do we know about how these people um, felt about their MOOC experience? So this is what we did. I told you we did a, a survey and we added a bunch of questions and we refined some existing surveys that were kind of out there in the community. And we sent it out to anybody who registered for the course because that's the mailing list that was available to us. We didn't pre-select for these engaged users. But, um, and in fact, we got about 600 people. It's, we, we said clearly up front, you do not have to have completed the course to fill out the survey because we wanted to find out something about these dropped people. But even those people who just registered and never showed up, 600 of them still filled out our survey. We took them out of the data. Because I don't know, how, you'll see what these questions are. I don't know how to make sense of their answers. Maybe we'll have a little fun and, and see what they're telling us. But it's kind of hard to rate the class when all you did is register for it. So we threw them out. And what we were left with are these students here. And you can see, by and large, you were more likely to answer a survey if you were one of these graded people, which is great, because then we know what they think about their experience. But I was also happy to have some representatives of this auditing concurrent the auditing delayed and in the drop people because we want to know what they what 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 they're thinking about as well. Okay, so there's their, there's our standard questions, um, and you can see from these numbers, even no matter if you were graded or auditing or even drop, people are happy with this experience. And these numbers for these questions, if you remember a couple weeks ago when Mika presented. These um, are higher numbers than our average course ratings here on campus. These students are pretty happy about their experience if they earned a certificate or not. The question we added, because I'm very curious about this, um, what makes you happy for taking a MOOC? When people talk about MOOCs and they're always talking about the low percent who get a, a certificate versus the 
hundreds of thousands who, who um, register, but that assumes that everybody registers to get a certificate. And we can see how many auditors there are. And we can see that, yes, um, the people who got graded are saying um, that they were achieved their goals. But this is, um, this is not neutral, right? This is the, the not the very satisfied, but the satisfied. So, and there's no difference between these three. So something's going on here that the people who are in it just to get access to the course material are, you know, they're okay with it. Questions about these numbers, comments? Jared. It's really interesting to me that, that it sounds like a bunch of people who never even showed up for the class even took the survey. And it's really interesting to me that if it's true, it's, it just, I'm trying to understand this question about survey bias. Like what, when people see a line that's this long and they click in the middle of it somewhere, or they click near the top, like what? It's really amazing that these numbers are so flat. Well, um, I know we have a, a, a person in the lab who's from the survey methodology a program at ISR, and she talks about straight lining. And we can go in and for these blocks of answers and look and see whether there's there's ways to detect patterns that suggest that someone really just wasn't all that invested in the survey. And we could compare the survey, the quality of the survey answers for these 666 people who never took the course versus these others. And that's something interesting that we can do. But for right now, um, you know, it looks, I don't think you straight line on fours necessarily uh, any more than you would on the regular course evaluation. What I think is interesting is look how consistent the numbers are for the instructor. So what this tells me is people are not dropping because they thought it was a crappy course or because they didn't like the instructor. These numbers are pretty similar to the people who hung in there the whole time. Rachel. I don't know that this is a question, but I'm mystified that I had a strong desire to take this course in something which is completely optional that people are clicking up is the lowest number of the four questions on average, <laughs> or almost the lowest. It's tied with, I learned a great deal from this course. I mean, I was wondering if, if there are open-ended questions on the yeah. survey, whether you gleaned anything about why that wasn't closer to fives. I mean, if you're actually going to register for completely optional extracurricular thing that you're doing in your free time, why isn't your desire stronger? That's a good question. I don't know. It's not as strong as as much as they liked it once they got there, right? Didn't they? Right? Yeah, it's interesting. These numbers are statistically significant, some of them, but um, but it, I mean, this size is huge and we want to do the post hoc comparisons, but, but by and large, um, yeah, this is, this is what they're saying about their overall impression of the course when they're done. Do, yes. Do the numbers um, change if you're looking at folks that wanted a certificate or what's the other, the signature certificate? The distinction? Yeah. We don't have that option for all courses and that's something we can pull out <laughs> later, the people who got distinction versus the sense of accomplishment. We can find the courses that had that option and pull them out. It's a good question. I was wondering if there may be folks that <clears throat> that didn't finish or so forth, they had a strong desire. They didn't have that strong desire to take it. Maybe they felt they had a strong need to take it. Yes, I think that's a very good point. And now that there's an option to take some of these and pay for it and get this whole verified thing, it'd be very interesting to look at some of these numbers for the people who paid for the experience versus the people who got it for free, because it's the same course. But what you get when the end of it is done is different. Yes. I think you said that there were some comparisons earlier between a course of classes that are on campus in, <coughs> mm -hmm. in, in person yeah. uh, with these classes. But were the evaluations That's a good question. So we did that seat of the pants last night late and uh, didn't go to the, the history of the course evaluations to pull that up and look at the difference but that's that's something interesting to look at it's it's only our kind of our best matching too for these courses and and sometimes we tried to control for instructors so if somebody like Scott who offers this course on campus took this course and made a version out of the MOOC then you it's a pretty it's a pretty good one-to-one -one analysis um, versus uh, some of these other courses where we just had to say, well, this course is pretty similar. It's not the same instructor, but it's offered in a unit. That's sort, you know, it was it was just sort of seat of our pants the best we could do to grab those. But it would be good to know. 
Was there another question before I go on? No? Yes. Yeah, in terms of that comparison, I'd just be a little careful as to even if the instructor was the same, how similar was the course? Oh, absolutely. Well, they're obviously they're very different, I, I just, right? That could, be, that could be a tricky comparison. No, absolutely. Absolutely. Nope, you're right. You're absolutely right. <coughs> uh, course materials. Um, we're sort of curious about what were people liking about this MOOC experience, and these are the basic things that you could do in the MOOC. Um, and uh, you can, not surprisingly, because the video is the main form of it, uh, that's the thing that they like the best. Um, here's where things get ugly. Discussion forums. Now, this is interesting because, um, well, one, because when you hear about MOOCs, another hype thing you hear about is all the study groups that students are self-organizing and all the ways that the peers are uh, finding each other and working together on the course material. Um, but it's also true that these discussion forums are not well used in the MOOCs, just like they're not well used here on campus. Uh, so apparently the students are unhappy either with the way they were used or how little they were used or the fact that they weren't used. Um, but in particular, um, this just doesn't look good. And uh, I felt connected with the instructor through the pre-recorded uh, lecture. You can see those people who delayed, the auditor delayed. They're, that number is lower. We don't, uh, did they ever even open them yet? Or did they open a couple of them? I mean, so the immediacy of it, the being there when it, it's being offered, at the time it's being offered, seems to give you a, a, a better sense of connection with the instructor, but that, that makes sense. Is Joe. Uh, not applicable an, uh, an answer choice to these questions? Mm, I think we would have put that on there. Yeah, I don't. Okay. I don't have it in front so of me, I, I but yeah. If people who aren't using the form are giving it a low score, just checking not applicable. Yeah, we can go back and check, but we're we're usually pretty careful with that in our survey design. I just don't have the instrument in front of me. If we didn't do that, shame on us, and we definitely have to make that change. This is what when you have somebody who gets their degree from ISR in your research group, it's awesome. <laughs> um, so getting back to the, oh, I'm sorry. New area for me. Um, do the faculty touch in at all at the discussion forums or no? Is it just only students? That's completely up to them, isn't it, Tim? Yeah, so, some faculty interaction in discussion forums. It, it's, it's really pretty onerous to try and have them be very involved in the discussion forums. What we try to do instead is have <coughs> their student assistants who manage the discussion forums and help manage the courses. <coughs> they go through and look for questions that have had a lot of votes or a lot of views. And then they'll they'll run those by the faculty members and get a definitive answer and post that as sort of a statement. Sometimes we'll post those and pin them to the top of the discussion form and lock them so it's kind of like this is our stance on this and that's pretty good. Thank you. So going back to the peer thing, right? It's not happening. These numbers, the scale represents uh, not at all too frequently. So um, and we gave them lots of options. We wanted to know where you know. Who are you connecting with? How are you connecting with them? Uh, no, they're not. That's not happening for the Michigan courses so far. Um, workload, we wanted to, thinking about Bill's work, about how many hours students study. Um, there's Generally, they say five. Um, here's how they view the course load. And this is a scale from very light to very heavy. So they're right there pretty much in the middle of that. And again, it, it doesn't really matter much what, what category you are if you are one of the engaged, the graded students versus the other. So um, I think we're hitting expectation for that. And it also tells me here these students who are dropping, um, this, this is a little bit heavier, but um, you know, they're, they're, not, they're, they're dropping because they um, perhaps are getting behind or having trouble with keeping up a little bit more often, but not really a lot. There was a question over here? Yeah, so this is just taking a step back for a minute. Um, the discussion yeah. forums, um, the student assistants, do, <coughs> do the students enrolled in this course see a face for this student assistant who's helping them through the discussion, or is it just It's textual. Or? No, it's textual. They can, they can have an image. I actually <laughs> recommend that they come up with some kind of alias to use because the students who take these courses are um, not very good about following the rules about not contacting faculty or, or course staff. 
And so they will send emails to the students and pester them and things if, if we don't try to protect them. So I, I personally think it's a good idea for them to not let them know they're going to not get too personal. I just wonder if that lack of a face of a, someone kind of there answering their questions and um, and then having one for the video lectures, maybe that could be. Yeah, it's a good question. It said, Tim, sounds like, you know, your recommendation is at least put a picture up so you look real. Yeah, and right. it doesn't necessarily need to be done, but something. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> all right. Dog, uh, cat. Right, the wallet <laughs> photo. These people, there are lots of people who do not respect privacy. They will email faculty and harass them. So, yeah. I mean, it's kind of the point where we've considered, you know, warning people that we'll kick them out of the course if they're not stopping. Mm -hmm. Um, this I, here's some numbers, some more numbers for you to look at, and they um, I think that they're uh, really. Uh, they, they tell us something about the dropped people in particular. You can see that the people drop because life intervenes, right? Mm -hmm. they, um, they weren't satisfied with how they managed their course. They, they appear in our survey as, a, as at least an engaged user at some point in time who then dropped. And why are they dropping? They, they weren't happy with how they were able to manage their time. Um, and uh, that the, the, the certificate wasn't the primary motivation. Obviously, for the people who were graded, who mostly got the certificate, they're rating that uh, more highly than the other people. Um, and then some of these other questions are kind of silly. Um, no, this isn't this. That's not as silly as the next one. But anyway, the, one thing we wanted to know is students have told me sometimes they take a MOOC to see how well prepared they are. They might be for another course, and that seems consistent across the board for all these types of engaged users, as well as some expectation that they learn something. Right. So if we don't have a grade, which you could argue whether that's a good proxy for learning or not. But um, th you know that those numbers aren't so bad They're in terms of thinking about whether people think they got something out of the course. Um, inspired me to to pursue the the topic further. That's uh, what a lot of us as faculty members hope for, that um, students want to stay and learn more. And, and there's just some other uh, some other uh, questions that we asked. Did I go forward or backward? No, that was just a box. Okay, right. Okay. Um, do you plan to mention it to your future employer or to your um, future institution? There's some uh, expectation that people will do that. Some people are saying they do that. Uh, and, um, and then there's some other questions we wanted to follow up with and revisit the course materials in the future. Uh, take the course again. Of course, this is the one that I said is a silly question for these people. If you took it and got graded and got a certificate, of course, why would you, why would you take it again? But look, uh, take another course by the same instructor. That's pretty high. Take another uh, course by any University of Michigan instructor. That looks very good, too. Um, but we're also having their good experiences bleeding off into other people, getting uh, other institutions MOOCs, uh, having students go there, too, unless students, if you come to a MOOC in the first place because you're willing to take it whenever. But I think this is good news for Michigan and speaks to the fact that we want to be delivering a good MOOC experience to our students. Yes. No, we haven't, but that's a very nice question that we can ask. Jim? So it's, it's striking that people are far more likely, literally statistically more likely to take a course from somebody else than from us. Do you, do you think that that's because of just a small catalog that we have? We have a small catalog relative some other, to some other institutions. I mean, if you go to the Coursera page, especially now with, what, 81 people offering, 81 institutions offering courses there. Um, so that makes it statistically less likely. It's one of a number of courses that you can take. Um, remember, the, these data are from our recent Winter 13 course offerings. So um, this is not the influenced by the early adopters, the early courses that we did. The, um, we, is there more to say about that in terms of? Um. No. OK, well, let's, let's move. Was there another question over here? No. Oh, that, that was right. Right, we talked about that. Okay, 
So um, we were, there are some insights and some questions, right? So well, the one is I think that our data shows us that this whole idea about you take a MOOC because you intend to complete it and get your certificate, um, it, we've got some pretty strong evidence, I think, that students are valuing their MOOC experience um, even without a certificate and even for those who never even thought about getting a certificate. Um, one question you might ask then is what implications does this have about grading? And uh, what, what does it mean for getting, uh, they, they're not coming to this course so they can show somebody they got an A in the MOOCs course. They're coming to the MOOC if they want to use the certification to say, I learned this material, I had exposure to this, I was engaged with it, I took this course. Yeah, Rachel. It seems like the comparison to grades is quite accurate given that so many of the MOOC students already have degrees. Yes, mm -hmm. that's know? a good point. And so grades when you're trying to earn a degree versus if you already have what is currently the currency in terms of employment and um, the certificate, I think, is going to have a different weight than mm -hmm. a grade for that population. Right. So, population. but I think we have to bear that in mind when we're engaging in the rhetoric about yeah. MOOCs offering people access to education who don't otherwise have this access. And I'm going to uh, try to. Uh, <coughs> you've already read these by now mm -hmm. while we've been talking, so I'm going to move on because I want to tell you. Uh, about a couple of next steps that we've got going on in the use lab. There was a, a, a competition for research grants funded by Gates. They gave out 25. We got two at Michigan. Awesome. And so some of the MOOC, uh, continued MOOC analysis we're going to do involves two postdocs who here, uh, here at Michigan, and I want to introduce them to you. The first is Chris Brooks. That's Chris. And he is looking at, as you can see from the title, the relationship between residential students and their MOOC experience. So in other words, something about these students, in part, right? Chris, do you want to say another word or two about? Yeah, I'm very keen on, on what alumni, how they use MOOCs, to whether they use them to re-engage with an institution, to continue their engagement, or whether it doesn't, doesn't matter and they're just using it for some tertiary learning, um, and whether there's opportunities uh, uh, even potentially for recruitment from MOOCs that are being offered by institutions. That's right. my focus. Right. If there are people showing up in the MOOCs who aren't uh, as prevalent on our campus, can we, can we uh, bring them here by virtue of identifying them and their interest and their performance in a MOOC? Okay. And the other grant we got, Tawana Dillahunt. You can see she's talking about this issue of whether there are pathways to employment. And so we're looking at some of these people here. Tawana, do you want to say? Sure. So um, the plan is to conduct a quantitative analysis to see how um, people who are unable to afford higher education perform in comparison to others. Um, there's also a qualitative component. We're going to try to um, speak to these people face-to-face. Uh, -face. We're going to look at those in Michigan. Um, and if we can't talk to we don't have enough people in Michigan, then we're going to reach out and have uh, Skype, uh, Google Hangout interviews that way to really understand um, whether or not they're using uh, these moves um, for employment, how so, and you know, try to understand if there are opportunities to create different classes, more practical courses to, to help in that effort. We can also find out some of the price structures for these pay for courses are $29, $39. Um, that's a pretty relatively low price point. Or is it? I don't know. Um, so, and do people who want to use these courses to um, move up the ladder, social mobility, are they more likely to take those courses or versus the free course? And what's the value of that extra certification and so forth? So there's a lot of interesting uh, questions that we can ask around that. So if you're interested in either of those topics, um, you can talk to Chris and Tawana because we just got these great uh, these grants. We haven't got the money yet. But um, those are two of the specific projects we're going to do with this data. So I think I'm officially out of time for those of you who have to leave at 1 o'clock. But um, we have, for those of you who don't, we can uh, stay longer and talk about this more if you like. Thank you. Okay, Connie. Okay. Uh,
uh, the data show that uh, the MOOC users are happier with the instructor than with the interactive portions of the course. But um, Tim may know, my, my impression is that um, some other universities courses uh, have real training and um, involvement to try to improve the interactive components. I'm not sure what other universities are doing, uh, as far as that goes. I would think some do. Uh, I can tell you that one of our huge peers does essentially nothing to help with that. They give them 50 They don't even help them produce the courses. Who is that? I don't want to say. But I'll talk, talk to the private if you want. But they don't, they don't even help them with video production at all. Nothing. And they basically say, here, here's money. Go make the course. They have to do this. So this may be a question for Stephen Eric. How messy is the data? I mean, yeah. <laughs> like from an analytics standpoint, what was it like to work with this massive amount of data that you didn't get to create the instrument? Or As well. I'm going to speak from my perspective and Eric can speak from his because um, I'm coming from the perspective that I've dealt with Sakai data for about 10 years now. So in that regard, it's actually somewhat cleaner because A, they had analytics in mind when they designed the interface. So it actually captures things a little bit more cleanly. Um, and there's also the, and even though the amount of data is much more, the uh, amount of tools is much, much, much less. So instead of dealing with 30 different tools with different events and different types of data, we're dealing with about six. However, we're also still dealing, while it's at a massive scale with 81 partners, it's also a startup. So the way the data looked for the first batch of classes last fall, versus how they change for winter, versus how they're going to change again probably for what happened in summer, and the intricacies of what happens per session, um, gives Eric's headaches. Eric, do you want to just say a word about the code that you developed and distributed and why it was useful? Uh, yeah, I can talk about that. So, let me think. So I guess like the Coursera data by itself, like once you wrap your, uh, once once you like wrap your head around like how the Coursera data tables are exported to you, you can kind of like that's fine because everything is in one format. I think the hard part was actually merging the survey data, which is something else. So a lot of interesting stuff like the like the qualitative stuff that you can use in addition to the Coursera information that's hard to merge together. Um, also, like the IP address, like basically for Coursera, a user is just an email address and an IP address. There's really not much you can get out of it. We actually had to merge the IP addresses against some other database, which takes several hours to run. Maybe I could have more better code for that, but stuff like that. Yes. Yes. Um, so it's, I'm curious about the discussion forum and if other institutions, or even here, there is um, has been an attempt to have kind of that. I don't want to, I don't want, well, this is going to sound like I'm inclined a certain way, but like a more substantive or more a follow-up um, with the course, right? Um, actual kind of, you know, discussions with people or groups of formally as part of the course that ever been tried here or at other institutions, do you know that they're trying to kind of complement or bridge the traditional with these? So some faculty have done Google Hangouts and we're, we're doing some stuff with that where the, we, we gather questions from the discussion forums beforehand and then have a Google Hangout and answer some of those questions and then also field some live questions at the same time. Uh, it's, it's very dependent on the faculty member. The, the thing to understand about the discussion forums is that it is extremely chaotic. I mean, you'll have sometimes a hundred threads about the same topic and people aren't even realizing that other people are having these parallel conversations. And so it's really, really difficult to manage. I mean, even when, you know, the student assistants put 10 hours a week into managing the discussion forums and, and that's still not even a drop in the bucket to what you could spend. I was going to um, add to that question. Um, I attended Google I.O., which is kind of Google's major conference, and um, Google's working on you know, creating a platform to allow for more, more social engagement. So the Google Hangouts, there are also office hours that they're trying to promote, um, as well as uh, their meetup groups that, are, that happen locally. I guess we don't have, um, we're not able to, to follow up 
you know, with, with that uh, directly, but uh, there are some meetup groups that are being created around uh, the MOOCs that are available. Yeah. And yeah, some of that, yeah, go ahead. No, go ahead. Uh, some of that's also, as Tim mentioned, depending on the lecture, uh, the instructor. So uh, the the uh, probably the uh, the one who does a lot of that is uh, Chuck Severance, and he uh, actively puts uh, on the announcements that week where he's traveling. And so I just got an email this morning that he's doing the local office hours in California this weekend. Come stop by a coffee shop and meet Chuck and talk about the class. He's pretty unique in that regard. Yeah. Yeah. I, don't, I don't know anybody else that did that. One trouble that we'll have with data is if you have a Facebook meetup group or something, you would take it outside of Coursera. We, we can't know it other than doing what we did here, which is in the survey saying, look, are you hanging out with anybody and talking about the course material? And so far we can see that's not, that's not really happening for our MOOCs, for the people who choose to respond to our survey. Anecdotally, I think uh, uh, Dan mentioned this last week too, and we've had anecdotally the same thing, that students will make Facebook Facebook groups or private groups about the class, and then the instructor might actually say, like, can I join? And they'll say no. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, students are leveraging all sorts of different, we, did, we actually had some sur follow-up survey questions also about tools, but because the numbers, the students actually doing that, at least on our survey, is so low, we didn't share that today. But We also had some major problems yeah. with copyright violations by Facebook, and Facebook will, mm -hmm. not, will not do anything about copyright violations unless the, the request for takedown come from the rights holders, and we couldn't get in and can do anything about the discussion forum, so we couldn't even take down these bit torrents to text for the introduction for mm -hmm. this course. Mm -hmm. Other questions? Anyone else? Yes. Just to comment, I mean, realistically speaking, from the discussion forums, that what makes it successful when in other, in those, you know, like online schools, the interaction between the professor and the students, you know, they're used for where, you know, the student will ask the question and the professor, they'll post something, the professor pokes and prods them more to get them the next level of understanding. And so realistically speaking, unless you can have that in something like this, which obviously is so chaotic and so forth, um, you know, it may not actually be successful in this format because that's probably what is needed. I mean, you can see students go way off the map and, you know, where, to where it's not useful to anybody that nobody even wants to look at it if you don't have some guidance there. So, um, I mean, I like, I like the idea of having a discussion form in something like this, but unless you get, give them the guidance, then I see why the scores are low and it's probably not going to change. One thing we've tried to do is we've tried to create subforms that are, that are very topical, so either broken down by the unit or, if necessary, broken down by the segment of the video. So that students are able to sort of congregate in a, in a smaller area and discuss those topics so it's not as, as scattershot. And, uh, and they, the one important thing to think about is that this is very much crowdsourced engagement. Mm -hmm. So it's the engagement amongst their fellow students. And usually they answer each other's questions. And that's where we try to, to intervene is if they can't answer each other's questions and the questions get a lot of votes and a lot of views, then we know that we need a definitive answer from the faculty member. So, and, and that's another reason why we try to use students who are subject matter experts. In some areas, introduction to thermodynamics, both of the students are subject matter experts and they were able to answer most of the questions that the students had without even needing to go to the professor. Mm -hmm. So it's, it's, it's very variable. But where you have problems with the discussion forums is frankly with, with classes where it's uh, more ambiguous content and uh, it's all open to interpretation and then people fight a lot about what's right and what's not. Yes. Hi. Hello. I, I just got, I think, a survey from you guys to, to fill out, which I haven't filled out because I just, I did Scott's course over this summer. Oh. Um, and so I haven't looked at your questions, but I'm really interested in, in trying to understand to what degree does um, the institutional um, affiliation with the course matter. In other words, in other words, as you're trying to understand initial interest in, in a particular, why did somebody choose this course? To what degree does it does it matter that it's being offered by the University of Michigan through Coursera? You just wrote some new survey questions yeah. for us. Mm -hmm. the, the, yeah. the question of like brand and branding is, is not. No. Yeah, we haven't we haven't done a lot of the exploring ourselves. There was an article that came out I think around five or six months ago from researchers that were looking at Udacity and edX, and they found that by and large that students remember who their instructor is. They don't remember the brand. So and this can yeah. be some of Chris's on Chris's project too. Looking at that, the branding will be important. The connection, but yeah, I think and you saw that they love the instructors and that it was for Michigan they rated highly, but 
not as highly as they rated the instructor. So, so please my, take our survey. Yeah. <laughs> my suspicion is that uh, I don't think it matters that much. Yeah. Like you saw from these numbers, like we only had like 941 out of like the 600,000 people that were that had UMICH emails. And then also, like, if you looked at the geographic location, only 4% were from Michigan versus uh, the 21% for California. So those follow the, I think it's the population of that state that follows that pretty evenly. But, uh, well, I, think. I mean, it's so, so my, I just, I don't want to belabor this, for example, what's my own, some of the Coursera courses I'm actually immediately um, attracted to whatever Stanford happens to be offering. So I go look at one of the Stanford courses. In other words, Part of my interest is, yeah. is partly um, geared to uh, Stanford, um, right. and and that sort of Stanford's provided for a whole set of reasons. Uh -huh. and I'm wondering to what degree, to what degree to understand it, if people people looking at courses offered by Michigan in the same way. Right. Well, there, it's no it's no coincidence that as soon as people like Stanford and MIT got in the MOOC business, that Michigan decided. We need to get us some of that, <laughs> um, but we've done it very cautiously and at a much at a much more measured pace than some of these other institutions because you can also dilute a brand, right? So I'm very happy that the students who've taken our courses are that happy with their course experience. That's good news. Um, yes. Yeah, I just wonder, is it, was there any consideration for students who might register for or another course from a different institution comparing their if they're shopping and comparing, no, we can't. We can't yeah. know that. We get the Michigan data. What our contract with Coursera says is anything that happens in a Michigan course, we own the data for that. Now we are establishing partnerships with a number of the other Coursera provider uh, uh, institutions, and um, one aspiration would be for a large combined data set where we could ask some of these questions, and even you know, getting closer to your to your question. How, how likely are you to take a course at one of these institutions versus another? And also the nature of the courses are probably different. Um, there's a big push by some of the lower tier institutions to offer these kind of gateway courses, you know, the early intro to kind of courses um, that you might go to a place like a community college or another kind of online, DeVry or uh, Arizona, one of those other, to take that kind of courses. The courses we're offering tend to be courses that you might come to a place like Michigan or Stanford to take. So there's going to be a lot of moving parts, um, which is, again, another reason to have a, a, a larger combined data set. We're at time, I think, but we can hang on. Yeah. So, Steve, do you want me to make a closing comment? No. That was it. <laughs> I think that was it.